Welcome to Hack Your Happiness. Failure is always a part of research. And I think it's really important. Um, you know, you want to fail because that's the best way that you can learn. Are you a teen or adult looking for more happiness in every day and ways to connect with people in your life? You've come to the right place. Hack Your Happiness is a podcast designed to bring you the behind the scenes of what brings iconic individuals happiness, plus their life hacks. I'm Mercedes. And I'm Anastasia. And we're the two teens behind Small Bits of Happiness. We're interviewing Olympic athletes, entrepreneurs, celebrities, and more. Throughout all of our episodes, you'll find great conversations, hacks that you can take away and try in your life, inspiration, as well as unique and surprising insights. Today, we're talking with Melissa Marquez. Melissa is a marine biologist, conservationist, and science communicator, and she is dedicated to exploring and protecting the wonders of the ocean. With a passion for marine life that began with her childhood in Puerto Rico, Melissa has pursued her dream of understanding and conserving marine ecosystems. Her work has taken her to diverse marine environments around the world, from the reefs of the Caribbean to the remote lagoons of Australia. As a committed advocate for ocean conservation, Melissa is deeply involved in initiatives that are raising awareness about the importance of conserving marine ecosystems and biodiversity. As an engaging and dynamic communicator, Melissa is also passionate about sharing the importance of conserving the ocean with audiences of all ages. Through her writing, speaking engagements, and media appearances, she inspires others to appreciate the beauty and complexity of marine ecosystems and to take action to protect them. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. We are so excited to be speaking with you today because you're such a young and successful marine biologist, specifically in the field of sharks. Um, but take us back to the beginning. How did your journey begin? You know, my journey into marine biology particularly focusing on sharks, really began with my childhood fascination with the ocean. Uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico, which is a Caribbean island. And so I spent countless hours just exploring tide pools and watching documentaries about marine life. So this passion really led me to then pursuing a degree in marine biology because I wanted to learn more about the ocean. And that was the best way to learn more about the ocean. And eventually I ended up specializing in sharks. That That's is amazing. so cool. When I was little, I remember we went on this trip to Hawaii and your story about, you know, being passionate about the ocean reminds me of this. Um, I got this book all about the different sharks and I read through it all and I was obsessed. I kept looking. We went to this aquarium. I was looking for all the sharks. And so when like we came across your story and being able to speak to you today is so awesome because like as yeah, uh, when really. I was little, I was obsessed with sharks and I think they're still so cool because there's such a variety of them. And I mean, obviously, you know all about sharks, but um, yeah. Definitely, and we spent also a lot of our time in Florida sometimes, and just a lot of sharks there too. Definitely, and <laughs> oh, the <yeah>. water <laughs> and the ocean is just so important to us, and yeah. it's so beautiful. So, throughout your journey, what has been your most significant challenge, and how did you overcome it? I think probably one of the most significant challenges I've faced is trying to overcome the misconceptions and the prejudices against sharks. So, there's a lot of bad. Well, to be fair, the, the sharks have a bad reputation. <laughs> they have a really bad PR in there where you say shark and people think, oh, it's a mindless killer. It's a bloodthirsty animal. Um, it's a man killer. And so many people have this irrational fear of sharks, which is fueled by media sensationalism and Hollywood stereotypes. So to combat that, I really try to strive to educate the public about the importance of sharks in marine ecosystems and also their true nature as these magnificent magnificent creatures uh, that really deserve our respect and protection. I love that because I definitely think that sometimes like when you think about movies like Jaws or all these movies with these big scary sharks. It's like a stigma. Yeah and I think that's so true like there's such beautiful creatures and it's so wonderful how you know you're working towards educating people and breaking that stigma because the sharks have a bad rep. <laughs> totally and I think Every animal deserves to, you know, have the respect and totally, I think sharks are really important because they contribute so much to the marine ecosystem. Exactly. So how do you exactly deal with people who might not intuitively be on board with your research on sharks or who might have those prejudices and be afraid of sharks? Dealing with individuals who are hesitant to push to support shark research um, due to these kind of ingrained prejudices as you said you know can be really challenging um, these sorts of situations really call for patience for a lot of empathy 
um, a commitment to providing scientific evidence and factual information to kind of help dispel those myths and misconceptions. But ultimately, at the end of the day, there are some people who are never going to be on board. And that's okay. You've got to meet people where they're at. And there are some people who will be absolutely terrified of sharks for the rest of their lives. And if I can try to lessen that fear a little bit, I'm happy with that. Um, you know, I, I 100% understand it. I study sharks, but I'm terrified of spiders. So, you know, everybody has their their thing. Um, so, yeah, sometimes you just got to meet people where they're at. Definitely. Absolutely. And, and I think that, like, providing facts and information and, you know, that scientific information, as you said, is always helpful because then it's, like, proven and it's not based on opinion as Definitely. much as, like, information. And but data. totally, it's also important not to, like, push and you know get you know push their boundaries and everything because to a certain extent you know you can't you can't do anything and everybody like you said has a little thing like whether that's sharks or spiders spiders or for some people they're even scared of like big dogs or anything Definitely. like that you have to you know be generous and totally. appreciate yeah and marine biology is such an amazing and interesting subject so a lot of teens are interested in this as well. So what educational path did you follow to be where you are now? So for people who are interested in pursuing a career in marine biology, I really recommend focusing on making sure they're getting a really strong foundation in science and math during high school. Uh, similar to that, you want to make sure that you have a really strong writing background. So an English background would be really good, making sure your writing skills are up to date. And a lot of people now are really delving into computer softwares or computer programming as something to help them as well. Uh, then pursuing bachelor's degrees in marine biology or kind of like related fields such as zoology or just biology in general, ecology, that can also help uh, go down this path and any hands-on experiences through internships, research projects, uh, field work is important too and can help a person out. Awesome. Totally. Yeah, I know. I know so many teenagers who are, you know, interested. The, the sea is such a fascinating, you know, area that has not been explored a lot. Um, what kind of computer programs um like is that that you mentioned a lot of people are delving into yeah so a lot of people are doing now work with any kind of programming such as r which is a free type of programming um i know that a lot of people use python as well so the different coding languages are really becoming useful to know if you're in marine biology or ecology because that's kind of how you do your statistical work um, so your statistical analysis. Um, other computer programs that I see a lot of people using nowadays, especially if you want to use non-invasive sort of technology such as drones or underwater cameras, uh, people are getting really familiar with uh, the software that's involved with those. So being able to, you know, download videos, uh, make sure they're timed properly, uh, make sure that you can do any kind of measurements if need be. Uh, and some people you know, super nerdy can go into maps and go into ArcGIS. I think desktop GIS is the one that's free. So you can learn how to take all of that data and make your own maps um, based off of what you're studying. So there's a lot of things um, that people can kind of delve into and a lot of free resources that are now available um, for people to kind of have a basic understanding before they go into university or from their bachelor's degree onwards. That's awesome. And that's so cool how, you know, computer programming, you might think, Definitely. oh, if you're doing computer programming, you're like, you want to be a coder or build a website or an app. But really, I it can apply to something like science and marine biology, yeah. which I think is so awesome. I love how marine biology has so many, you know, a wide range of you know topics you need to know I and skills like definitely it's so amazing yeah awesome and definitely i feel like there's so many different ways to explore marine biology and different ways to get to yeah that path really doing what you're interested in um so in terms of your research and your work what has been one of your most challenging moments and how have you overcome it uh probably definitely facing setbacks and failures in the field uh when doing my research and you know, it's one of those things where I've learned to view these challenges or these roadblock, roadblocks as opportunities for growth and perseverance. You know, by staying resilient and really adapting my approach of what I'm doing out in the field, I've really been able to overcome 
obstacles and continue making progress in my research. I love that. And I love how, you know, no matter what you're doing in life, whether you're out researching sharks or maybe you're a teenager in high school or maybe, you know, you're trying to apply to a university or college, there's always going to be setbacks and, you know, like you said, roadblocks. But just seeing that as an opportunity to learn and to grow really shifts your mindset from, oh, no, I'm struggling to now I can grow and become better. Totally. What have been some of your recent research? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Well, I was going to say failure is always a part of research. And I think it's really important. Um, You know, you want to fail because that's the best way that you can learn as well. For me, some of those failures have been cameras have gone missing. Cameras haven't recorded the very important things that I need them to record to. Um, You know, the data has gone askew or... uh, the SD cards have gone corrupt. So a lot of things that some of them I could definitely have prevented. And I know now better in the future, other stuff that it just happens to be that way. And you say, all right, well, thank goodness I have a bunch more cameras that I can kind of rely on. Yeah, totally. And I think that's also having, you know, like you said, like yeah. one camera fails or fails to record, but you still have others. And it's like not putting all your eggs in one exactly. basket. I was just say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And having I guess don't just rely on one thing just be able to move from one to the next and even if you're like a teen and even if you're like a teen and you know I think sometimes to teenagers who focus all their attention onto one thing maybe it's one sport or one extracurricular it's kind of even applying that into our own lives and saying you know maybe I should try to diversify a bit and focus on you know still maintaining good marks and still maybe trying out different things learning more about myself definitely that's it yeah especially now it's such a good age to try a bunch of different things to figure out what is it that you really like. I mean, I'm still doing that. And, you know, I'm, I'm an adult. Um, so it's one of those things where we're always learning more about ourselves and also about the skills that we have. And if you don't get something right away, because I know, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I definitely struggle trying to do something and then not getting it right away and being like, oh, well, can't do that. I'm done try and try again, because it is one of those things that you then start moving kind of where the starting line is for you by continuing to try again. And who knows, maybe by the third time of you trying it, you actually nail it. And you're like, Oh, actually, I really like this. Awesome. Yeah, Yeah, it's just important to try things over and over again. So uh, I know we kind of veered off from this, but what has been your most recent research? Yeah. My recent research right now is for my PhD. So it's looking at our relationship with sharks and how that's changed over time through uh, different sorts of legends, through folklore, through the media portrayal as well, and how that differs in between different countries. That is so cool because I think it's true as media shifts and as the role that sharks play in media shifts, there's definitely different ways that people see it and that they perceive sharks in our lives and it's very fascinating yeah definitely yeah so um what are your top three tips for teenagers to be able to multitask and become multifaceted like yourself well i think first and foremost it's embracing any opportunity you get for learning and growth um even if it seems daunting at first uh kind of how we said earlier cultivating that diverse skill set by exploring different things that you like including different fields of study um and different extra curricular activities um, and practicing effective time management and prioritizing the tasks based on their importance and any kind of deadlines that you've got. I think time management is probably one of the key things when it comes to going on to being in university. So those would be probably my top three. Yeah, totally. Time management is key. It is so important. Do you have any specific things that you do to manage your time? I do a lot of lists <laughs> and a lot of alarms for certain things of just reminding me because, um, you know, I do have quite a full schedule and sometimes I think, oh, I'll remember that. And then I don't. So writing things down is always really helpful. Um, having a planner, if that works for you, is great. Uh, writing it on like Google Calendar or anything like that is wonderful as well. So yeah, just keeping on top of that. And sometimes uh, there's this method of organization that's called time blocking. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. What is that? I don't know if I've heard of it. Yeah, me neither. So time blocking is kind of having multiple things that are really similar bunched together at the same exact time. So I'll give you an example. Um As a scientist, we have to read a lot of scientific articles, uh, but that can take a lot of time. I also have a dog who 
is a very active dog. And so he goes for really long walks. So what I end up doing is I end up pairing those two together or time blocking them. So when I walk the dog, I'm also listening to an audio version of that article being read out. So I'm still getting all that information while also still exercising the dog and of course, exercising myself as well. So that's three things off of my checklist that I have done in say like an hour. I absolutely love that because that's such an effective way to use your time rather than, you know, having three hours, one that you're walking your dog, one that you're going for like a workout and one that you are totally. reading your you're scientific articles, so you're doing time. it all in one go. And I love that. And I think that that's something that everyone can do, use and do into their daily routine and, you know, combine some tasks together. Totally. Maybe you're cleaning up your room while, you know, you're calling your friend or maybe that means that you're cleaning your room while listening to an audiobook. I know that I love to do that in the mornings. I love to listen to audiobooks because oh, yeah. it's a small bit of happiness. And Totally. Yeah. And sometimes what I'll do is if I'm trying to talk to a friend, but my whole day is really busy, just talk to her while I'm getting ready. And it just, exactly. you know, you're hitting two birds with one stone. <laughs> it's so much easier yeah. to move through the day. So what kind of dog do you have? <laughs> I have an Australian Shepherd. I love Australian Shepherds. I've been having one for so long. Yeah, They're really cute. I'll show you guys him in a little bit. He's sleeping right now because we just went for a walk early this morning. So he might pop his head in and bark asking for attention in a second. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. I yes. love Australian Shepherds. They're so exactly. cute. So what is one thing that you would love to share about sharks and shark conservation to our young audience? I think the really crucial role they play in maintaining healthy ocean ecosystems you know they're top level predators more often than not not so sharks really help regulate populations of prey species um, they contribute to the overall biodiversity and the balance in marine environments so think of it almost like you know have you guys ever played jenga yeah. yes yeah you know how like the idea of the game is to try to take little blocks out and put them back up on top until you unfortunately take that one block out that crumbles the entire tower yep Exactly. That's basically what sharks are. They are that one important block that if you take them out, the whole entire ecosystem kind of crumbles into something different that we don't really know what that is just yet, just that it will be unhealthy. And so I'm trying to teach people that, yes, I understand they're not the cutest looking animals. Yes, they do have this fearsome reputation behind them, um, but they are that really important crucial Jenga block in the Jenga tower of the entire planet. And what is our planet mostly covered by? Oceans. So if you don't have healthy oceans, you're not going to have a healthy planet and you need healthy shark populations to have a healthy ocean. I love that. And it's so important to, you know, shift our perspective, especially as, you know, we, we learn more about the world as teenagers and understand that, yes, they might seem scary, but that doesn't mean that they're not also important. And I think that's so important also not to just say sharks, but for a large variety of, you know, animals and things all around us because, you know, just because we don't like it necessarily or we're scared of it doesn't mean that we should, you know, kill it or... Be afraid. You know, exactly. Yeah. So I think mm. it's really important just to... Even if you're still not the biggest fan of sharks afterwards, it's just so important to, you know, know that they are that piece of the Jenga tower, which I love that example. Yes, that's a that great, if you like, take tangible them out, example. Exactly. If you take it out, the whole thing will just completely crumble. Yes. So what would you say on that topic are some of the biggest myths about sharks? Ooh, man, there's quite a lot of them. I think probably the biggest is the belief that they're these mindless killing machines and that they pose a really significant threat to humans. So kind of how you said earlier in the podcast, there are so many different species of sharks. There's actually over 500 different species and scientists are discovering new species all the time, uh, which I think is really cool. But of those, there's a really, really small minority that have ever bitten a person. And really of those, there's only three that regularly kind of bite people. And those are the great white sharks, the tiger sharks, and the bull sharks. Um, and so I think labeling this entire animal species as a threat to humans is wrong and incorrect. And, you know, shark bites on humans are very rare. Shark fatalities are even rarer. Um, and most shark species are not aggressive towards humans unless they're provoked, such as 
you grab their tail or Florida so famous I think like every year there's a person who tries to kiss a shark on the mouth and then they get bit and they don't understand why so there's usually a reason as to why uh, a a non-aggressive shark species would suddenly bite a person but again shark bites are very rare shark fatalities are even rarer and so this myth of all of them being mindless bloodthirsty animals out to kill us is exactly that a myth yes i think so exactly because especially with people trying to kiss a shark i mean it's not the sharks exactly you're You're aggravating it it. yeah they are wild animals after all you don't want to go up and kiss a bear or kiss an eagle so exactly that it just doesn't make any sense to me would you blame like a bear or a tiger for you know hurting you if you're going up and petting it (laughs) if especially if it's not like um in a zoo zoo or some in a place where you know they're trained to the important thing is to like respect the sharks and respect their environment let them be and then we can be and then totally the ecosystems can be happy exactly so what has been some of your favorite moments working in this field there's so many of them um i think probably one of my favorite is actually um and it hasn't come out yet, the show, but I do get to work with some really cool species, both deep water and ones that you haven't seen normally on TV. Um, and I get to go down in submarines to deal with those animals, which is really cool and get to see behaviors of these sharks that nobody has seen before. So that show I think is coming out later this year. It's called Ocean Explorers that you guys can see me um, helping some amazing scientists do their research and learn a little bit more about these sharks myself. And so I think getting to collaborate with scientists worldwide and conservationists worldwide and work on a diverse array of shark species during research expeditions is probably my favorite part oh my goodness well first of all where is your show coming like what channel or streaming platform is it going to be on that one is going to be um, a national geographic and bbc show so it'll probably be on disney plus i think but i'm not 100 percent sure on that that makes sense that yeah we'll definitely be totally. watching that sounds amazing that sounds so much like that just sounds crazy <laughs> Yeah. I cannot wait to watch. I know that, that sounds amazing be... to see them in like the deep water and like, to learn about so many different species of of sharks. That would just yes. be that sounds incredible, like an incredible you know journey. And then to be able to like watch back and relive those memories through a show totally. is also so epic. Yeah, um, it's so, pretty surreal. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So, um, as we were saying earlier in the podcast, in the bio, in the intro, um, you traveled a lot for your work. Where are some of the places where you've spent a lot of your time? Most of the places that I've spent my time are like the coastal regions that are known for their really rich biodiversity and diverse shark populations. Uh, So lately um, I've been here in Australia, but I mean, I've traveled to the Caribbean. I've traveled down to South America, um, over to Europe. So quite a few different places to help uh, either help be a part of a project or help lead a project. Amazing. And where has been your favorite place so far? I think the Arctic, just because it's so different from anything else that I've kind of experienced. Um, And it really blew my mind with what was down under those waters. I bet that's incredible. Yeah, the Arctic, I feel like is so different from those warm climates like Australia or the Caribbean. How are the sharks different in the Arctic? They are not as cute. (laughs) I'll say that. Um, And they live a lot longer as well. So those are homes to animals that live hundreds of years instead of just, you know, less than 100 years. Um, or 100 years. So yeah, there's some really interesting sharks up there. Um, The main one up in the Arctic Circle is the Greenland shark. And that is just an absolutely fascinating animal. Wow, I'm gonna have to go on Google after Definitely. this podcast I'm so excited and like, to learn more about this. researching up what these Arctic sharks look like and the Greenland shark looks like because that sounds so Definitely. interesting. That little like seven year old in me that was so obsessed with the sharks. The child's coming out. Yeah, but- <laughs> I'm warning you now, they're not the cutest, but they are a really cool species. Just getting to learn more about them and how they operate in such a cold environment is mind blowing. But they're not great in the looks department. I mean, I think that sometimes you 
need prioritize, you know, <laughs> survival in one of the coldest places oh, yeah. on earth than, you know, yes. looking super cute. <laughs> Although so many sharks are really cute. Well, there are, yes. <laughs> so while working in this field, I'm sure that you're so busy and there's not that many yeah, time. I mean, you said your breaks. schedule is jammed. Definitely. Down. But how do you take downtime? Because downtime is so important in order to be successful. So how do you usually like to spend the time? I like spending my time outdoors. Um, so that kind of is the best sort of downtime for me is just spending my time outdoors either at the beach or Australia is incredible for its forests and its different types of habitats. So going exploring there, uh, practicing yoga, uh, walking this dog all around. Um, since he's a puppy, he's only six months old. Um, we really want to kind of just show him Australia. So we usually go traveling with him and getting to see how he views things for the first time through almost it's like childlike eyes um is really special and it makes just going out into nature so much fun and also it's a little bit nerve-wracking because there are quite a few things here in australia that he can get into dangerous situations like snakes and spiders that is so sweet oh yeah. that's so cute i know i know anesthesia <laughs> there was a time when we used to go with our chocolate lab to dog parks all the time and every time we'd see an australian shepherd anesthesia was like that's my future dog <laughs> no i have been oh. in love with australian shepherds ever <laughs> since i think i was like 10 or 11 i was i just saw this one little puppy <laughs> and you know it was so fluffy <laughs> and he was just so sweet and then our neighbor's daughter has an Australian Shepherd as well and one time we went to the dog park with it and oh my god he was so sweet <laughs> yeah yeah so I I know that I think when I'm older I think I might try to get an Australian Shepherd if I have enough time for it because it does sound like a little bit of a time commitment <laughs> with you know oh, yeah. the amount of activity <laughs> yes so um as you said you've been interested in the oceans from a young age um what is some advice that you would give to your younger self what's one piece of advice that you would give your younger self I think one piece of advice I wish I could have given to my younger self is what we touched on earlier, which is embracing failure as a natural part of the learning process. Um, because I think the fear of failure really made me afraid to some, take some risks and pursue some passions wholeheartedly. So yeah, I think be a bit more fearless and it's okay to fail. I love that because it's so true. Like Definitely. I think it's all about mindset and all about perspective. And if you see your failures as a chance to grow, then that's what they'll be. And if you see them as your downfall and as a way to feel sad and, you know, get upset and stop feeling motivated, then that's what they'll be. Totally. And I feel like teenagers just feel like they're so afraid to fail because you know, being a teenager is, you know, such an important part of learning and finding out who you are as a person. But it's also, you know, really full of, oh, you know, if I do this and I don't like it, well, then I've wasted time. And, you know, if I fail at this, then maybe I won't be able to, you know, get into the university of my choice. But or... I think seeing it all as one big exactly. journey rather than like a step out of your journey is really beneficial. Mm, totally. And I just think that exploring different things is so important to finding out what truly brings you happiness and what is truly, yes. you know, So you. on that note, what do you do every day that brings you a small bit of happiness? I like to find small moments that bring happiness. Um, I've learned as I've kind of gotten older not to take the small things for granted. So sometimes a simple thing such as having a really good cup of tea makes me really happy or getting to finish a really good book or starting a really good book. Um, we get some really gorgeous sunsets and sunrises here in Australia. So getting to see those beautiful things and just, you know, putting your phone down and really immersing yourself in watching the natural beauty of the earth is really um, exciting. Connecting with loved ones is also a really big one. Uh, so most of my family and most of my friends are overseas um, from me being here in Australia. And so I try to carve quite a lot of intentional time to talk to them and catch up with them. Um, and so I really treasure those moments and playing with the dog 100% always brings me a smile. They just, some of the goofy stuff he gets up to, there's not a single day I haven't gone through since owning him that I have not smiled because he's done something funny. So it's just little things like you don't need huge, big, miraculous things to happen to you every single day. Sometimes it's just as nice as hugging a friend or holding a loved one's hand. I love totally. that because that's so much what we're trying to spread with exactly small the small things the small things that happen in every day I think honestly give us more happiness than 
once in a while having a big thing happen to us like oh yay it's our vacation that we've been waiting for for three months but then it's over and then you're sad whereas if you're looking for those small they keep good happening things, again they and happen again. every like you get to see your dog every day or call and a i love i love how our dogs they're so small but they have such big personalities mm -hmm. i know my best friend mm -hmm. she yeah. has two huskies <laughs> and it's one boy one girl and they just have such you know huge personalities that it's so it's they're like so people funny. exactly i mean they're such a huge yeah. part of the family you can basically hear them on you know if they're looking at you a certain way you basically know exactly what they're thinking about exactly and especially for really smart dogs and smart breeds like australian shepherd he sometimes looks at me and i'm like i swear you're talking to me <laughs> That's so funny. It's exactly the same. Yeah, with, yeah. with the chocolate lab that we have, Coco, yeah. the Huskies. <laughs> totally. I mean, our, our dog, Coco, every time, you know, when she's hungry, she looks over at you with these, like, I don't even know how to describe them with these you know, eyes. Though. And you know exactly what she wants you from do you. Know. yes. And she also makes sure oh. to bop us with her nose. Yes. She has this cute little thing where she just constantly bops you. It's hilarious. So sometimes it can get a little bit, yep. if she's constantly doing it. Yes. But so do you have a motivational quote that you love and remember? And if so, would you be able to share it with us? So one of my favorite quotes, and most people might not think of this as motivational, but I'll explain why. So it's a quote by Sylvia Earle, um, which is with every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you're connected to the sea, no matter where on earth you live. And it doesn't sound like a motivational quote, I know, but to me, it really is a reminder of our interconnectedness with the ocean and with the importance of protecting it for future generations so that to me is a motivation of not stopping what i'm doing um it's especially on the days where it can get a little bit tough and a little bit down when you know you're dealing with trolls or uh, a new report comes out and things are looking bleak it just kind of goes to it just i go back to this quote and i think there is a reason why i'm doing what i'm doing and the reason is, is because all of us are connected to the ocean and I'm trying my best to educate people on how that is and why that is. I think that having like that purpose behind your work and that totally. intention is truly such a great thing to fall back on and have on those moments when it's not a great time because there's always going to be good days and there's always going to be not so good days, but having something like to ground you and to, that can remind you of why you're here in the first place, whether it's a quote or, you know, a story, something that's happened in your life in the past, I think is just so important. And and I love that because it's true. The ocean really is connecting it's, it's all of the us. the center. I mean, the majority of our earth is water and we're surrounded by water constantly. I mean, water is also what keeps everything alive. And I think it's so important to, you know, keep it safe and conserve it for future generations exactly. and keep you know the marine environment also safe because you know it's so important and everything in this world is interlinked exactly mm. so do you have anything exciting coming up i know we were talking about your amazing series of, of um, underwater sharks and all that but is there anything else or anything else you'd like to share with us yeah, so I've got the Ocean Explorer show coming out later this year. Um, I'm going to be on National Geographic Shark Fest again in July, which I'm really excited about, where I kind of break down a little bit of the science behind shark bites um, that happen worldwide. Uh, and I've got a new picture book coming out at the end of May that is, again, part of that sort of educating people about sharks, um, but also because I'm Hispanic, bringing a little bit of my culture in there. So it's a picture book that focuses on the power of community, even in the ocean and how that has lasting effects for the whole planet. That is so beautiful I and I love how you're putting aspects of your culture totally. into That's something so, so global and so important for everybody, that being the ocean and conserving it and talking and learning about it. Exactly. That is amazing. So is there anywhere where our audience can um, find you on social media, et cetera, our website so they can keep up? Yeah. So I do have a website. It's melissacmarquez.com. Uh, I have a Twitter or X, um, which is MCM Sharks XX. On Instagram and Facebook, you can find me at Melissa Christina Marquez. Uh, and I will be starting up a YouTube and TikTok channel pretty soon. So keep your eyes on that. Awesome. Well, well we all of those will also be linked in the show notes. So very easy, simple access for anyone who's looking. 
But yeah, this has been so incredible and inspiring to speak with you, you today. Thank you so and much. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely oh, amazing. Yes, this is amazing. Your work is so needed. <laughs> thank you guys so much. And thank you so much for doing this, you know. The ocean and happiness are so intertwined. And so I'm glad that, you know, we have two other people who are advocating for that. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Hack Your Happiness. And a huge thank you to Melissa for joining us today. Her work is just so inspiring and so needed. And I think it's so cool how she has such a dynamic range of, you know, mediums that she has to educate the world and individuals of all ages really about marine life and the beauty of our ecosystem, how she's got a TV series, books, speaking engagements, and more, and how she's currently also working on obtaining her PhD. It's just so amazing her work and I truly think it's so needed because so much of the ocean covers our world but really like we know so little has been explored and I think it's also so cool how she talked about journeying to the totally. Arctic I and mean, the difference is, between the sharks in Australia and versus the Arctic. She has so many achievements she's so amazing so iconic and I am so happy we <laughs> yes. were able to talk to her today. So Asia, what would you say was your biggest takeaway from Melissa today? Other than learning about all the amazing types of sharks <laughs> I think my biggest takeaway was that failure is okay and that no matter what you're going to experience failure and that you know it's just the biggest lesson and you know you shouldn't try to hide from it or avoid things just because you're scared you're gonna fail and even you know if you're on your third try maybe by that time you're starting to actually get the hang of it and you're able to you know do it really well and so I think that I learned definitely that failure is super important for growing as well and also understanding what you're good at and maybe what you're not so good at so you can kind of grow in those areas. A major thing I learned from Melissa is the importance of truly following your passion because as she said she's been in love with the sea and interested in it from a young age and the fact that she's been able to follow that interest and follow it all the way through um, and become so successful at it I think it's just a ever-present reminder of the fact that if you truly love something there is a career and there is an opportunity for great success out there and I also think how she talked about you know some of the failures she's experienced don't put all your eggs in one basket I think that her cameras are a great example that we can apply to other fields sometimes maybe she forgets to put a camera on or it just doesn't record you know how technology can be these days but not having you know having backup cameras having other ways that she's gathering her information and her data we can apply that to not putting all our eggs in one basket just because you want to excel at a sport doesn't mean you can't also do well in school just because you want to do one type of extracurricular maybe you really 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 want to join the art show at school you can also be you know running your own little business at home maybe selling your art there's so many different things that you can do so don't limit yourself. If you enjoyed this week's episode of Hack Your Happiness, please leave us a five-star review from wherever you're listening. It really helps us out and we really appreciate it. Also, be sure to join our happiness family and support our podcast by following Hack Your Happiness on whichever platform you're listening. It's completely free and we'd love to have you join our happiness family. See you next time. time.